Chinese President Xi Jinping. And in March of this year, the Chinese government decided to do away with presidential term limits, which basically paved the way for Xi Jinping to rule for the rest of his life. And Chinese internet users, they responded to this in the same way that everybody responds to everything in 2018. They use memes. So Chinese people have been using these Winnie the Pooh memes to poke some gentle fun at their leaders for a pretty long time. And a lot of this is happening on this app called WeChat, which, if you're not familiar with it, it's this super popular app in China. Um, it has uh, something like a billion monthly active users. And in addition to messaging, it encompasses lots of different functions, things like ride sharing, meal delivery, e-payment, and lots more. And so around this time, I was in this group chat on WeChat, um, and some friends and I were swapping these memes as well. And very quickly, we started to notice that half of the images weren't even going through. And basically what was happening was that WeChat's censorship mechanism was sort of preventing the images from being sent. So for us, this was, you know, we had a bit of a laugh about it, but actually surveillance and censorship on the internet in China can have really, really serious consequences. So this is a man named Chen Shou-Li. So Chen Shou-Li is a construction supervisor, and he lives in central China. And he was in a group chat on WeChat of his own, and he made you know, kind of a little joke about one of China's leaders. And very quickly, he found himself sitting in a prison cell for five days. And unfortunately, this is not that uncommon of an experience in China. There are lots of stories of people facing harassment, intimidation, detention, even arrest for things that they've said on social media, both in public and in forums that they believe to be private. And this actually gets a whole degree worse if you happen to be part of an ethnic minority group that the government perceives to be a threat. So as a journalist, I've done a lot of work in this region that you see here, which is called Xinjiang. It's this massive region in the west of China, right on the border of Central Asia. And so for the past couple of years, the Chinese government has been waging this kind of systematic campaign of digital surveillance and arrest for um, you know, the millions of ethnic minorities in this region. And there are up to a million people now that are being held in these massive internment camps. And when I talk about surveillance here, I'm talking about you know, all this kind of brand new technology, things like iris scans, cell phone scanning devices, mandatory participation in DNA databases, and more. And a big kind of part of this surveillance campaign is the imposition of a kind of communications blackout for the Muslim ethnic minorities in the region. And by that I mean if you're a Uyghur in Xinjiang, if you get caught making a phone call or sending a text message to friends or family who live in a country other than China, you could be sent to one of the region's massive internment camps just for that. So hearing all this, it's sort of tempting to think, you know, China is this kind of Orwellian surveillance state that is totally impossible to live in, and this is just an unsustainable kind of situation. But the reality is a little bit more complex than that. So at the same time that all this surveillance technology has been rolled out, China's digital economy has really been flourishing. It's a digital economy that's worth something like $3.8 trillion. And just to give you an idea of what that sort of looks like on the ground, you know, China is a country where in cities you can see homeless people with QR codes because e-payment is so convenient and so ubiquitous that nobody even carries cash anymore. It's a place where you can get just about anything delivered within a couple of days for a pretty low price, and it's also a place where you can access just volumes and volumes of news and entertainment in your own language, so much so that you're not necessarily going to miss services like Facebook, YouTube, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you know, because those services are all blocked by the government. So what's the, the kind of significance of this, right, is that if you're a Chinese internet user and you're not an ethnic minority, you're not particularly interested in talking politics online, it's quite possible to be using the internet for quite a while and think, you know, things are just getting better and better here. And the upshot of that has been this kind of bifurcated experience of the internet in China, where if you're part of one group, a group with privilege, um, your, your experience of the internet is one of convenience and abundance. And if you're part of a different group, it can be an experience of surveillance and of fear. So where do tech companies come in on all of this? So 
If you're a tech company that's operating in China, you are obligated to um, comply with the government's rules on censorship and the provision of user data. And foreign companies are not an exception to this. So Airbnb, just as an example, a few months ago ha um, said that they are providing user data to Chinese government agencies um, you know, based on the country's regulations. And Google famously is now developing a censored version of its search platform uh, for possible use in the Chinese market. And so one of the rationales for this has always been the value that these companies can bring to Chinese internet users. But companies, in addition to thinking about that, they also have an obligation to think about that second group of individuals, the people who are the most vulnerable in the country. Because for them, these questions about user privacy, they're not just an abstraction. They can be a question of life or death. And so I, I want to leave you with a story, you know, one personal story of an experience of mass surveillance told to me by a man who I'll call Omar. And I met Omar in Istanbul. And Omar is a Muslim Uyghur. He was born and raised in China, and he sort of left a couple of years ago. He saw the crackdown coming, and he sort of got out while the getting was good. But he left most of his family back in China. And because of this kind of communications black hole that I've mentioned, he had no way of really communicating with them. So when I met Omar, I asked him, you know, what, what do you know about your family? What news do you have? And to my surprise, Omar knew a lot. He knew who was in the internment camps and who was still free. He knew who had gotten pregnant and who had just gotten married. He had all of this information. So I said, like, you know, if you can't communicate with them, where are you getting this info? So it turns out that Omar had found a kind of loophole. Basically, Omar's sister, who lived back in China, she had a business partner, and this business partner was a foreign national. And because he was a foreign passport holder, he could sort of travel freely you know, in and out of China whenever he wanted. And sometimes he would go to Turkey on business, stop by Omar's house, and you know, share kind of all of the news of the family. And the crazy thing about this is that Omar did not have this guy's phone number, didn't have his email, his Facebook, his WeChat, his WhatsApp, like nothing like that, just had no way to get in touch with this guy. And they did, this, did it this way sort of on purpose because they were afraid of surveillance. Basically, the only way that Omar could get news about his own family was just to stay at home and wait and just hope and pray that this guy would show up and sort of deliver the news that he needed. And the reason that story has stuck with me is that, you know, in this incredibly kind of connected and networked world that we all live in, it's state surveillance that made Omar and tons of people like him communicate in ways that they could have easily done hundreds of years ago. Thank you.